Creator God, you made the earth and all that is in it, and you called all of it good. Open your hearts this morning to the goodness of the land on which we gather. Open our hearts to the presence and witness of our indigenous neighbors who have cared for this land for generations before our own. May the calls of truth and reconciliation take root in the good soil of our hearts. From Psalm 78. So God commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven, bringing down manna upon them to eat and giving them grain from heaven. So mortals ate the bread of angels. God provided for them food enough. The Lord caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and powerfully led out the south wind, raining down flesh upon them like dust and flying birds like the sand of the seas letting them fall in the midst of the camp and round about the dwellings. So the people ate and were well filled, for God gave them what they craved. Rise as you're able to proclaim the gospel. Gospel according to John, the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him there on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, how did you get here? Jesus replied, I assure you that you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs but because you ate all the food that you wanted. Don't work for food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for internal life, which the human one will give you. God the Father has confirmed him as his agent to give you life. They asked, what must we do in order to accomplish what God requires? Jesus re replied, this is what God requires, that you believe in him who God sent. They asked him, what miraculous sign will you do that we can see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus replied, I am the bread of heaven, of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. When I leave here today, I'm going to have lunch. And I'm sure most of you will too. Janice and I are still on vacation for a few more days and so we might go out for lunch, we might order in, or we might scrounge the fridge and make something at home. Some of you might be making plans to go for lunch together or stop in on friends or family for a shared bite to eat. We have lots of options open to us, don't we? Our gospel this morning speaks to us of two types of food, physical and spiritual. Up until this point, I don't think Jesus' followers got exactly what he was offering them. 
he had to put it into the context of something they could understand, food, and more specifically, bread. Bread was essential, basic, and pretty much available to everyone, whether they were rich or poor. If you were poor, you might not have meat, cheese, or even fresh fruit or vegetables, but you likely had some kind of bread to sustain you. Beggars in the streets were more likely to be tossed a piece of bread or some crumbs as opposed to something more substantial. In our gospel today, Jesus once again is followed by the crowds as he tried to get away with his disciples. This passage comes right after Jesus fed the 5,000 with the five loaves of bread and two fish. So they had just seen Jesus do this amazing thing, and now they wanted more. Jesus calls them out on their single-mindedness. He says, I assure you that you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate all the food you wanted. Maybe in a roundabout way, Jesus is asking them, ah, hungry again, eh? If we look back through our Bibles and the stories we hold dear in our hearts, most of them involve food in one way or another. Food is shared, bread is broken, meals are prepared. Just like in our own lives, how many of our own precious memories are centered around shared food? From big meals to small snacks, from buffet tables to teaching a child or family member how to make a cherished recipe, food brings people together in ways that little else does. Food is essential to our lives and let's face it, we all like to eat, right? The folks in Jesus' time were no different. But Jesus was also trying to make a bigger point in our gospel passage this morning. He's trying to get them to understand that there, he was here for more than just as a source of physical food. He was here to show them who God is through the things he was doing, the miracles, the teachings, and yes, the food was all pointing them to God. Up until this point though, had they been missing the bigger picture? Jesus tells them, don't work for the food that doesn't last, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the human one will give you. We have all been approached by people asking for money for food. On the streets, at corners and parking lots, bus stations, everywhere. I don't carry much cash with me anymore, but even when I do, I must confess to say no more than I say yes. I can try to justify why I say no more than I say yes and chalk it up to the lack of actual cash in my wallet, but sometimes it comes down to my own judgment of their circumstances, or at times, I simply can't be bothered. I don't like to admit that, but there you have it. There are times when I have helped out, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, but on balance, I think I'm in the red on this one. If I look to the faith I claim to believe in, I need look no further than the fact that God always fed people. When God's people were hungry, God provided enough food for the day. Jesus always fed people. When the crowds followed Jesus and flocked around him looking for miracles, signs, and wonders, he also saw their physical hunger and he fed them. No one was asked why they didn't have any food with them. No one was asked what they had spent their money on instead of food. No qualifications, no prerequisites, no judgment. He fed them and then he taught them. Pope Francis has said, you pray for them, and then you feed them. That's how prayer works. Sometimes we get too hung up on who deserves help and who doesn't. I'm more guilty of that than myself. I'm more guilty of that myself, and believe me, I do work on changing that in my own heart. I am making progress, though, in my own understanding of what Jesus would actually do because he showed us over and over and over. He fed them 
and then he taught them. He showed us who he was with compassion for their physical needs, and then he taught them with compassion for their spiritual needs. It was never either or, it was always both and with Jesus. My parents came up during the Great Depression and that experience formed the rest of their lives. And in turn, it impacted the four of us kids they raised. Our home was a happy one. We weren't well off, but we had what we needed. Mom made most of our clothes and she took in sewing for other people. She worked shift work at Krella Naders in Preston up until the time my younger sister was born, when I was about five. My dad worked at Eastern Steel, later Frink of Canada, for about 42 years until he retired. Their early years were hard. I recall my dad saying he would do anything to make a buck, find something, fix it up, turn around and try to sell it. He did welding on the side during my growing up years. When it came to food, I remember my mom telling someone that things never got so bad that they didn't know where their next meal was coming from, but there was nothing extra either. Mom was good at making food stretch. She baked, she canned, she chopped and froze things like rhubarb and beans for later use. She bought items on sale to stock the pantry shelves for those times when not much was on sale and didn't give in to the whims of us kids who wanted all the cool breakfast cereals and snack items we saw advertised on television. That is, when we got a TV in the early 60s. <clears throat> I do know that mom and dad had friends who were not as well off as we were, folks who didn't know where their next meal was coming from. I only heard those stories when I got older. Sometimes their situation was because of poor choices, but sometimes it was through no fault of their own. No matter what the reason, people still needed to eat. That is just as true today as it was back in the 50s and 60s. I know my folks helped out when they could with what little they had, and they did it without judgment because that's just what you did. You helped. But for a few breaks in life, that could have been us. I have begun to realize that it isn't my place to judge people who need food. They need to be fed. Only then can other problems be addressed. Study after study shows that school children cannot learn if they are hungry. This is the main reason why school breakfast programs are so vital and need our support. We have offered different programs for providing food here at St. Peter's over the years. Years ago, we would give out a voucher for, the, for a meal at the Cambridge restaurant. We put together bags of food, cans of ready to eat items with plastic utensils that we could give out upon request. Our garden has fresh vegetables for the taking for anyone who is hungry. We support the Cambridge Self-Help Food Bank throughout the year, but it's not enough. People are still hungry. The root causes of that hunger need to be addressed, for sure, and the sooner the better. But in the meantime, people are going to bed hungry. They need to be fed. I spoke about Jesus' compassion Oh, sorry, they need to be fed. I spoke about Jesus' compassion for people two weeks ago, and last week we listened as Mo Pastor Monica told us about the feeding of the 5,000. She said, quote, this story begs the question, is bread only ever about literal bread, bread that feeds the body? If you have enough to eat, I guess you could say yes, but what if you don't? What about people who can't sleep because they don't know where their next meal may be coming from? Is bread only ever about literal bread? And what do we do about that?" End quote. I freely admit, I can do much better. I can be more intentional about bringing food each week to be taken to the food bank. I can afford it. My parents couldn't and yet they helped whenever they, they were able. 
I can be better about saying yes when I'm asked for money and keeping my judgment to myself. If I don't have any money on me, maybe I can take 10 or 15 minutes and take someone to the local subway or burger joint and let them choose what they would like to eat and just pay for it. I can do better. And what about the other piece of our gospel reading this morning? What about the food that endures? A few years back, I came across a book entitled Take This Bread by Sarah Miles. I have it here. Let's see that. Sarah lives in San Francisco and is a writer, journalist, and editor who covered stories across the world. She was also an atheist. But on this particular day, she walked into a local Episcopal church that's Anglican for us Canadians, for no reason she could think of. She took a chair among the 20 or so others who were there and tried not to catch anyone's eye. Sarah participated in the traditional service much like our own with liturgy and singing. And when the invitation was given to come to the table because all were welcome, she received Holy Communion for the first time in her life. From her book, I quote, and then we gathered around that table and there was more singing and standing and someone was putting a fresh crumbly, a piece of fresh crumbly bread in my hand saying, the body of Christ, and hand me the goblet of sweet wine saying, the blood of Christ. And then something outrageous and terrifying happened. Jesus happened to me, end quote. Sarah's life changed that day. The bread of life that endures found a home in her life and blossomed into something no one, least of all Sarah, could ever have predicted. Sarah became attached to St. Gregory's Church and through learning and growing in her faith, eventually became their director of ministry. However, her biggest impact was food. From that one piece of fresh, crumbly bread, a food pantry was born right in the sanctuary of that church. She saw the need in the neighborhood around the church for food, good nutritious food that could truly nourish the bodies of the mosaic of folks who lived there. From the food pantry's website, it reads, the food pantry launched in 2000 offers free fresh groceries to 400 families each Friday, right around the altar of St. Gregory's of Nyssa Episcopal Church in San Francisco. At the food pantry, we believe in building community by empowering people to work together and share food with neighbors. The food pantry is short on bureaucracy. We don't ask hungry people to fill out forms or prove they are deserving. We're strong on participation. Most of our volunteers are folks who came to get food and stayed to feed others. Food can change lives. Jesus can change lives. How can they work together? Can they work together here at St. Peter's? There's a lot of food insecurity in our neighborhood. Can we help? How? Can we do that? I'm not saying we turn our sanctuary into a food pantry, not necessarily, but we can do something more than we're doing, which don't get me wrong, is a really good start. People need to eat. We're smart people here. I know that if we think about it, we can come up with a plan or a program to provide food for people. Some places offer food boxes, much like the little libraries you see on people's lawns. They're about the size of a newspaper box. Inside, there are easy to open cans of food with plastic utensils free for the taking. We could start up the bags of food program again. We can bring more food for the food bank each week. It could be yet another idea we haven't thought of yet. Our gospel this morning says, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father 
who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. A couple of weeks ago, I said that we, you and I, are the face of Jesus. We are also the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the ones who need to reach out and feed those who are hungry. We can do much if we pray about it and work together to make it happen. Jesus can happen with something as small as a crumbly piece of bread. Amen. as you are able for the hymn of the day, God of the Fertile Fields. Oh, yeah. 